and happy Father's Day to all of those who are here who are fathers or who had a father <laughs> or still have one. I read this morning uh, in regard to our father from James chapter 1, verse 16. James says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. This morning we come to worship. We worship our heavenly father. He is a good, good father. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord with people that know love me. And you know, because I'm reminding you, that I love you very much. I appreciate you and all that you do. Um, not appreciate you for what you do. I appreciate you for who you are. You're a good, good people. Because you've got a great, great father. Uh, a few things this morning I'd like for you to know. Uh, one is that I visited with our new assistant pastor Friday afternoon. They're excited about coming and have found a house and uh, are looking to relocate soon. They'll be with us on July the 14th. And I think I, the first task I want to assign Terry is to sit over there on Sunday morning and smile at all the choir members who come that way. <laughs> it, it does my heart good to... Uh, well, it does my heart good to see you smile back at me and, and to keep that smile throughout the whole service. It, it's just a wonderful thing. Uh, so Terry's coming and his wife, Shanna, they're coming and we're looking forward to that. Uh, I need to let you know that um, out in the narthex, the foyer out there, there's the two tables set up. One is for the Ministry of Hope. That's in regard to people who've, um, who, faced, who are facing or have faced cancer, whether it's you personally or someone you love. There's a great ministry uh, set up out there to tell you about that. And also the spiritual gifts table. Uh, the Bible says that all of us, when we come to Christ, we are filled with God's Spirit and He equips us. These are not our natural talents and gifts and things that we've learned. These are spiritual gifts that, um, that it's God working in us and through us. So drop by there on your way out. I also want to remind you that you should sign up for the Power Lunch this Wednesday. They're uh, going to be a great group of people talking to us about the recent trip to Germany. Our church group that took a trip to Germany walked in the footsteps of Martin Luther, the great reformer so, of years ago. Um, and also, I know I'm going to get in trouble about this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, Marvin McNeil, stand up, please. Come on. Come on. Uh, Marvin, I want to say thank you for all the work that you've done. I don't know what all that encompasses, but I know you were a trustee for several years, and you've also been the building and grounds person for a lot of years, and you recently retired from the building and grounds trade, and I just wanted to say thank you for all the work that you've done to make this place a wonderful place. Yeah. 
do you want me to do this again at 11? Okay. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't warn him, so uh, I, I apologize for take, get, catching you off guard. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, do I have anything else? Oh, it's cookie day. Father day and cookie day. So now the, the, the purpose of cookie day is to get us to uh, fellowship more because we are family and family need to spend time together. And because somebody said, you know, it, it, it is now that we have four congregations and some of us never see the other. Well, I know that in a congregation this size even, some of you come in that door, some of you come in that door and you leave that door and you never do meet. Take time today to eat a cookie and talk to somebody that you don't know. Get to know them. Most of them have their name badges right here, and you don't even have to ask, hey, what's your name? And I've come to learn in however long I've been here, it's okay to say, tell me your name again. <laughs> Most people aren't offended by that. Um, I, I, I've, in fact, I appreciate it when you come to me and say, you remind me of your name. I, I am getting better at, at recognizing names. And you may have noticed that I call a lot of you by your first name. If I can remember it, I do that. <laughs> so, so you know, if I don't, when I greet you, I don't call you by your first name. It's because um, I need help. <laughs> and you're going to help me. Um, uh, this morning, I want to say uh, welcome to our um, two, two groups of people. Uh, one is our, I don't know what to call them, help me here, our streamers, those people who join us because we have a camera back there that goes on the internet and people are watching um, from all over the United States, maybe all over the world, I don't know, but uh, there are a lot of people who join us every Sunday morning at 9. In fact, um, down at Provident Crossing, we have family members, our church family members down there, and they gather in a group on Sunday morning in their theater and worship with us. Yeah. So wave at them. Your choir, won't you all wave at them? Good morning, good morning. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, I, I was, uh, got a report this morning that folks in, what did you say, Wisconsin? Uh, way up north, uh, uh, all over the world. Huh? New Mexico. Wow, it even gets to New Mexico. Wow. Um, so we want to we want to welcome those folks and say uh, we're we're delighted that you're here. Uh, I I trust that uh, the warmth of this fellowship comes across the internet in some way, so that the, you know that you are loved and appreciated uh, for who you are, wherever you are. And the other group of people, wait a minute, huh? Your sister watches from South Africa. Wow. <laughs> I wonder how long it takes uh, our signal to get from here to South Africa. <laughs> uh, the other group of people that we want to say welcome to this morning are those of you who are here for the ver very first time. Uh, we want you to know that we are glad that the Lord uh, prompted you to come worship with us today. It may be that he did that um, by some friend or neighbor or whatever. That's good. And it may be that you just heard about the worship place somewhere and I pray that you heard that it's such a warm fellowship. That is that uh, people, well, they don't tend to make space on the end of the row for you, but they do make place for you in there. <laughs> um, there's room in our hearts um, for all that God will send. So th what we want to do is welcome those who are first-time guests, and the way we do that is to invite you, if you're willing, to stand where you are, tell us your name and where you're from. And I'll start over here today. Anybody first-time guest? What about this section? First time guest. All right. Good morning. Well, let's start right here, down front. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Erica. I just moved here from San Francisco. Erica just moved here from San Francisco. Welcome. <laughs> Carolyn? Caroline. Caroline. And you're from? Denton. Okay. We're glad you're here in college. God bless you. We love young people. Anybody? What about the middle section? First time guest? Yes. Tell us your name and where you're from. Uh, Rosie from Kansas City. I just moved here. Uh, Rosie from Kansas City. Just moved here. What neighborhood? Um, 24. 24. Do we have any 24s? There's some 24s, yeah, some of your neighbors. Glad you're here, Rosie. God bless you. 
What about this section? First time guest. All right, in the far right over here. First time guest, anyone? Okay, well, if you chose not to stand, we're glad you're here too. What we would ask of you is to take one of those connect cards in the seat back in front of you. What do they look like? Looks like this right here. Take a connect card, complete that, take it out to the welcome center, and they'll give you a nifty cup that it has that little uh, worship place uh, name and logo. That will remind you of the wonderful morning that you had at the worship place, right? And it'll remind you that you're always welcome to come back and worship and fellowship with us anytime. If we can be of help to you, those who are moving here or whatever, uh, let us know. We have a nifty bunch of people who are very, very active in their uh, loving their neighbors as they love themselves. Let's stand and welcome one another. <laughs> standing if you would we're singing about the faith on this father's day that we have in our heavenly father faith is a victory that overcomes the world
Let me invite you to read from Proverbs 11:24 with me this morning. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but becomes poverty. Pray with me. Father, thank you for reminding us that you are aware not only of our actions, but of our hearts, our thoughts as well. We pray, Father, this morning that you would hear our hearts cry. For we cry, Father, we need you. We need you all the time, even when we think we don't. We're thankful, Father, that you have promised us that you're always with us, that you never leave us, you never forsake us. Indeed, you love us beyond our capacity to comprehend. And in that love relationship, we can have the peace that passes all understanding. And indeed, that peace guards our hearts. Father, this morning we lift up these great United States of America, a country that you have blessed richly. And pray, Father, that we could be a light to the world. Not a light of prosperity and capitalism, but a light of grace and truth and love. A light of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray, too, that you'll bless those who serve our country, President Trump, all the military, people who work in first responder positions, and and really just every person who serves our country. We pray your blessings on them as well as their families. Father, we pray for our country, too, that we could be more united as one. Help us, Lord, to work in such a way that brings about the best good for the most people. And help us, Lord, to... Really remember those who are less fortunate than we, who are struggling with life. Help us, Lord, to be caring and concerned about them. We pray, Father, for our missions and benevolence uh, recipients, for all the ministries that they do around the world. Lord, we um, invest in them that they might continue your great work around the world. We pray, Father, too, as we come to give you a gift, that you would receive our gift It is a token of all that you've given us, but it is a reminder to us that all that we have and all that we are belongs to you, for we indeed have been bought with a price. Father, we pray for our family that are hurting today. Pray for those who need healing, that you, the great physician, would touch them. We pray for those who grieve and ask, Lord, that they experience your comfort. We pray, Father, for those who are struggling to be faithful to you, Lord, that they would find your spirit your grace sufficient. And we pray, Lord, now, this prayer that Jesus taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Terry. Well, this morning before I read the scripture from Matthew 16, I want to say thank you. The only problem I have with saying thank you is uh, where, where do you stop? But we were talking about the streaming and those people that um, are privileged to watch us all over the world, anywhere they want. Uh, there's a lot of work back there that, that goes on, a lot of people that make that possible. But I was just thinking about the, you know, those cookies and taking up the offering and greeting. And, and where do you, well, you don't stop, do you? Um, if you have not found your place of service yet, I encourage you to do so. Uh, invest in the kingdom's work um, with what you can do with your hands as well as other ways. Um, somebody said, well, uh, all I can do is pray, preacher. Thank the Lord. We need you more than ever. So thank you for all those who make things happen. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, choir. Thank you, everyone. Um, it, it is painful to overlook people. So uh, if, you, if you do anything, if your heart's beating right now and you're sucking in air, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this morning, I want us to talk about your opinion counts. It matters. What, what your opinion, when I say opinion, I mean it's what you think or believe, right? What you, what you believe matters. Can I tell you a joke right quick? I, I, I told it at the men's retreat Thursday, but I'll, I'll tell you. There's this fellow who, um, who, who decided he was dead. And, and uh, people would say, no, you're not dead. You're talking to me right now. No, I'm, I'm dead. And finally, one, one fellow who thought he was very wise said, let, let me offer this logical, rational explanation. He said uh, to, the, to the man who said he was dead, do dead people bleed? He said, no, they're, if they're dead, then their hearts quit uh, pumping. And so if you cut them, they, they wouldn't bleed, right? And so the, the man says, give me your finger. And so he pricked the man's finger, and he started bleeding. He said, oh, I guess dead people do bleed. 
Your opinion matters. <laughs> let's, let's go with Jesus and the disciples, and specifically Peter. We're using Peter these next few months as sort of our um, example of growing spiritually and emotionally and watching him in his relationship with the Lord. Let's go with them up to northern uh, part of Israel. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? In other words, opinion poll. What, what, what are folks saying about Jesus? And they replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? Not, not what everybody else is saying. What about you? What's your opinion? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, he's typically the one who's the spokesman. And keep in mind that we're, we're probably two and a half years into Jesus' three years of earthly ministry. He will leave here and, and will head back toward uh, south toward Jerusalem where he'll die. He says, um, uh, Peter says, you are the Messiah. Hebrew word, Christ, the Greek word, Christ and Messiah, they mean the anointed one of God. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. I mean, it's two and a half years. There, this is the, the, um, the pinnacle of the ministry of our Lord when he's asking them, and um, he says, don't tell anyone. I, you know, I grew up in Mississippi. I have four sisters. Um, two older, two younger, and we had lots of cousins, first cousins, and typically we'd get together quite regularly at uh, Grandpa and Grandma's house, uh, um, my, on my mother's side especially, and even my great-grandfather's house. We'd, we'd go and uh, meet all these cousins, and we'd play games together. And of course, having four sisters, I learned how to get along, right? Go along to get along, to survive. <laughs> Uh, but they, they would like to play this game called Mother May I. It's a lot like Simon says, but in Mother May I, one of the mothers stands at the front and everybody else lines up across and um, uh, mother gives a command and then the person in the line says, Mother May I, and, and then moves according to what mother has commanded. And if you don't say Mother May I, you have to go back to the beginning point. But the goal is to get up to where mother is, and you get to play the role of mother and, and be in charge of all the other kids. I was thinking about that um, as I was meditating on this scripture about Peter. I was thinking about uh, that game that those children play and how oftentimes, um, you know, you, 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 she'll say, mother may, may say, take uh, three giant steps. And I forgot to say mother may I, and you got to go all the way. It's two steps forward and three steps back. Is life like that for you sometimes? You're trying to make an advance in whatever area of your life. Maybe it's financial, relational, whatever, and, and you, you make progress, and then all of a sudden something happens, and poof, you're a setback. You have that life? Is that your life, or, or is your life just steady, smooth sailing? Uh, I think most of us have these difficulties. Um, but those childhood memories reminded me that life is like that. It's not just a, uh, you know, a steady um, growth process. S sometimes I, we get knocked back. Sometimes we step back, but we don't make the progress that we could. Well, Peter this day made a leap of progress in his spiritual development. I, I say it's his spiritual development. It is at least a demonstration of his spiritual maturity. You are the Christ. He got it. Or at least he got it according to his opinion, his belief, his understanding of who the Messiah was. Um, Peter's progress could be described like Mother May I. It's two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward and four steps back. Uh, that's the way it is for me. Isn't it ironic, though, how that so often it is the case that uh, our growth, spiritually, emotionally, personally, our, our growth, that the best growth comes about in the most difficult times. 
It's a, someone said, um, smooth seas don't make a strong sailor. <laughs> it's weathering the storms that make a, a strong sailor. And so it is with a Christian, a faith that's not tested, probably not very strong, not very mature, not very stable. Those difficult times indeed are God's way of helping us to grow in our Christ likeness. And some of you are saying, well, I ought to be just like Jesus then for all the things I've been through. Well, it's not just the fact that you go through them. You can go through them and not grow. It's growing through them and then seeing the Lord's hand in it and how he was with you all the time and blessed you. And that causes us to grow in our faith. Um, it is ironic that our best growth happens in difficult times. Uh, that, that's why I think we say God is good all the time. Because you know, because you've been there, that God is good when there's smooth sailing and God is also good when the storms of life come crashing up against your boat and you're hanging on for dear life. You know that, and so you can say God is good all the time. Like David said in the 23rd Psalm, Oh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know you're with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We know that. We walk through the valley with the Lord, not in order to get to the Lord those testing times can be growing times. And so it was on the day that Jesus said, who do people say I am? And who do you say I am? In fact, I would argue that that is the question of life. Until we've answered that question, we're not apt to go very far. Can you say with me this morning, Jesus is Lord? that he's Messiah, that he's my Christ, that he died for me, and I know that because he rose again from the grave that I too have eternal life? If not, then today's the day to answer the question. Your opinion matters, not just for now, but for ever. I want to take you to Israel this morning. Uh, I've been there a couple of times. It is a beautiful spot, way up north, has a lengthy history. Uh, so I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. We call it Caesarea Philippi, but um, most of the locals call it Paneus or Baneus. Uh, do you see on the upper part of the map, you see Dan? Um, well, just to the right of Dan is Baneus, and it's also called Caesarea Philippi. Uh, it's called Baneus or Paneus, a P or B, because some languages don't have one or the other of those sounds. Um, but it, it was, was called Paneus after the Greek god Pan. Uh, you don't want to go there, but just know that it's one of those um, gods of the Greeks and one of many, right? And people worshiped God. And so they, this was a very, very religious place, or we might call it a very irreligious, immoral, immoral place. That is, they worshipped all kinds of false gods there. But it's way up in the northern part of Israel. And the Dan, you saw that three capital letters, D-A, Dan up there. Uh, it has an interesting history too. We went to the, uh, the ruins of the city of Dan. And Dan is where when the northern and southern kingdom fell. Uh, this is some of the um, archaeological digs of the city of ancient city of Dan, Old Testament time we're talking about, um, when the king decided that he was going to set up places of worship. In fact, we have a marker that indicates that. Uh, it's a historical marker. Here it is. First King, oh, go back. Uh, First Kings 12, 28. And the king made two calves of gold, and he set one at Beth El. Beth El means house of God. And the other, he put at Dan. So that people could go there and worship rather than going to the southern kingdom down in Jerusalem. In other words, he wanted to make it convenient. And so what did he do? He set up a, a calf for them to worship rather than a temple to Yahweh God. So it has a very negative history in the life of God's people, the Hebrew people, the Jews. But it's a beautiful place. It's a place with a lot of history. Um, and, and if we were to um, just go uh, north a little bit more, we would go to Mount Hermon, the highest place in Israel. Kaledi, show that sign. That the, Here's a picture of uh, this. You see the big cave. That's the place where the water comes out of the mountain. 
uh, the mountain just north of there would be Mount Hermon, snow-capped mountain. So when the snow melts, it, it comes out of the ground there. And there's a lot of history, a lot of um, um, belief about that water that comes out of the ground. And you'll see these other little niches in the side of the mountain. Those are where they put these idols. Uh, there were temples there, all kinds of temples. So it's a very, very religious place. And when King Herod died, uh, what was that, 4 B.C., Philip became the uh, ruler of that area. Um, and so Philip rebuilt the city, and he um, named it Caesarea, the area of Caesar. And remember, Caesar by this time is not, it is a name, but it has become a title, like the emperor. Caesarea, uh, the area of Caesar, and he put his name on it, Philippi. Now, there's another Caesarea in Israel, Caesarea, we call it Caesarea Maritima. It's over on the Mediterranean coast, um, so we, we see that later. But here we are with the water coming out of the mountains. You get to walk, uh, you get to walk up this little trail. In the, yeah, there it is, beautiful. Uh, when, we, when we've been to Israel, we walk uh, and cross over this little uh, stream two or three times. It's a beautiful place coming out of this ancient history of um, the people. In fact, here's a coin that Philip, and during Philip's time, and you'll see Philip on the left and the god Pan uh, on the other. So again, the idea is that it's a very religious place, all kinds of worldly religions, and this is where Jesus takes his disciples and says, who, who do people say I am? So you see, he's sort of pulling them into the conversation. Who do people say I am? And then he says, who do you say I am? The most important question that we'll ever answer in our lives, who do you say Jesus is? And Peter, you know, being the spokesman, you are the Messiah. You're, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Oh, man, we're, we're sky high now. I can't imagine. I, I'm trying to imagine how Jesus must have felt when Peter, oh, you got it, boy. You got it. You, and, Peter, and, and so Jesus says, uh, you, you're the rock. You're the rock. Um, the area has this long paganism. So when Jesus says, who do, who do you say I am? Uh, I can just imagine how it touched Jesus for them to recognize him for who he was. But he says, don't tell anybody. It, it all came down to this moment, this question, this response. And so Peter's confession, as uh, the artillery people would say, on time and on target. You, you're right on. So Peter, Peter just got to take, mother, may I? <laughs> yes, you may. And he took that leap forward, leap of faith. You are the Messiah. And Jesus rewarded him with saying, you, you're Peter. You're a rock. And maybe he was turning and pointing at this great rock where it had been so many religious uh, things happening. You're the rock. And upon this, upon this rock, I'll build my church. He said, I will build. Not you, Peter. I'll build my church. And the gates of Hades. Some people say that that, um, that cavern from which came the water, that it was a bottomless pit. And that's the gates of Hades. But hell won't be able to stop you church, if you have faith that Jesus is the Messiah of God. Now, let's go from this point of great demonstration of faith to a great demonstration of fear, a 180, if you will. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. In other words, you've taken on the opinion of the world now. Verse 24, and then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Going from faith to fear. I would argue that the ability to accept the whole truth is a sign of spiritual maturity. The whole truth. That is, 
that when you come to Christ, when you give your life to Christ, life is going to get great, and you're probably going to be persecuted. It's both. People who say, well, just give your life to Jesus, and it'll be a bed of roses from here on to glory. They're lying to you, and I bet most of you can testify to it. Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. Jesus himself died on the cross. Being a Christian doesn't exempt us from heartaches and hurts, and especially those that come because we proclaim Christ as Lord. It's both. And spiritual maturity is demonstrated when we can say, I can hold on to both these truths. Peter wasn't there yet. He regressed quickly from the rock to the stumbling block. He's the same person, isn't he? How can, one, how can, the, how can the blessings and the curses come out of the same mouth? <laughs> it's a reality. I am able to do great things with God's grace at work in my life. And I can turn right around and be the devil's advocate in the same minute. Like Peter, do you have this issue? Growing to do. Sometimes I'm a rock, and sometimes I'm a block. And oh, God, help me not to cause anyone to stumble. I know all of you can tell stories about pastors, preachers, ministers that the devil has used as a stumbling block. I know that many of you can talk about churches, church families who have become stumbling blocks to others. Oh, God, help us that we would never be a stumbling block to the people who want to know the Lord. We would ask questions like, why, why, why did Peter say this? Was he trying to protect Jesus? Ah, it makes sense. He didn't want Jesus to die on the cross. But more than likely, Peter said, no, 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 this can't happen because Peter's belief, his opinion, his um, idea of the Messiah was, you're going to be a military leader. We're going to throw off the Romans. We're going to be a, a, a nation of our own again. And, and Jesus said, that's, that's not, it's not time for that yet. There will come a time, but now is not the time. And so Jesus is disciplining Peter. And uh, isn't discipline a good thing? I mean, you, you disciplined your children, right? And you did so out of love because you wanted them to grow up and be mature and self-supporting and loving. You want them to be good, well-rounded citizens of, yeah, of humanity. You, you did it out of love. And so the Lord, our Father, disciplines us. He says, get behind me, Satan. I mean, like he did to Peter. To discipline us, to help us, help us to grow, help us to learn. So if, if, you're, if you're hearing uh, the Lord say to you, get behind me... Uh, Know that it's out of love. God disciplines those he loves, like any good father would. And so, Peter, well done. You're the rock. And I'm sure Peter's chest pooched out and his head swelled up big. <laughs> and then it was like, you know, one of those cartoons where poof, uh, the pin prick and that big balloon head swivels to nothing. God can use both those situations to help us grow. Um, so it is with, with you and me, I think, that God calls us uh, to be disciples. He calls us into a relationship with himself, and we walk with the Lord, and we're blessed. and we grow. He gives us all that we need. Uh, Coletti has a, a raised bed garden, and she likes to make things grow squash and cucumbers and tomatoes and peppers and things. Uh, and she provides for, for good soil, fertilizer, water. Uh, uh, no, I provide the cultivation. And um, <laughs> God provides the sun and the um, rain, all that. And, and it, it usually grows. The other day, uh, I think it's been, was it two weeks ago now? I went out to check on her uh, raised bed garden, these tomato plants. Uh, and I noticed that um, down toward the bottom, they're just lush and green and lots of leaves. And up toward the top, they're not just little stems with no leaves. And as I looked a little closer, there's these big old green worms, big size of my thumb, big and fat and fluffy and plump. And um, so I, I helped them to find another place. <laughs> and, 
and I relieve some of their pressure as well. Um, and um, I, I just say that to say that even though the Lord provides all the things that we need to grow, there's someone out there who wants to mess it up. I say out there, sometimes he's in here. Sometimes I'm my, my own worst enemy. But know that your church family is here to provide the nurture and the growth and the fertilize and the cultivation and the, all the things that we can as your brothers and sisters. But there's someone who wants to suck the life out of you. His name is still Satan. He's still the devil. And if he's after you this morning, say with Jesus, get behind me, Satan. Did you know that now in Christ you have the power to do that? We have the power to do that? To just say no? Just say go? Get out of my way, devil? You have that power. But you got to claim it. You got to say it. You got to live it. These are growing times, and the tomato worms are very active. So when you face uh, heartaches in life, and we all do, challenges that, um, that, that challenge your opinion of God, I, I know my experience has been that there have been times when I, when I, when I said, God, are, do you really love me? The circumstances suggest otherwise, Lord. Where are you? I bet you've been there too. Our call from the Father is when those times come, hang on. Don't, don't turn to other means, other sources, other trust in God. When the devil wants to tempt you to go another way, hold on to what you know. When the feelings, when the emotions say, this, this, this is not good. I can't, I can't even sense God's presence anywhere. Hold on to what you know. Don't let your feelings lead you down a path that will lead your thinking down the wrong path as well. Who do you say I am? Answer that question today. Write it down somewhere because sometimes you may forget. Sometimes the circumstances may make you think that, oh, did, 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 was I wrong? Go back to the word you wrote down and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my God. I trust in you. Your opinion matters. Your opinion counts. I remember many a coach saying way back when, um, believe it and achieve it. In fact, we've probably seen t-shirts. A lot of school teachers use that, right? Believe it and achieve it. There's a lot of truth behind that. Let your faith do the walking. And especially when times get tough. When the, when the smarts just don't seem to be able to figure it out, remember your faith. Jesus, you're the Messiah. You are my Lord. Your opinion matters. And Jesus said, take up your cross, follow me. And when he was talking about the cross, taking up our cross, uh, he was not talking about, you know, the one that hangs around your neck or on the tabletop. He was talking about dying to self. You see, you can't live for yourself and for Jesus too. We live for him, for his glory, and he takes care of all the rest. And then, as the scripture said, one day he will reward you for all that you've done. Some of us experience some of those rewards now, don't we? There is a blessing to being faithful to God. But oh, you, as they, my folks say in Mississippi, you ain't seen nothing yet. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing it's going to be. Reward day is coming soon. Be faithful. Be faithful to him, to his word. Pray with me. Our God and our Father, we bow before you to say thank you for your presence in our lives. 
We thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for us. We thank you for your spirit who indwells us even now. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit's work of conviction to uh, show us any sin in our lives, any wayward thinking. And, Lord, uh, your Spirit's work to bring us back um, to looking to you, to trusting you in all that we do and all that we are. Father, I pray for those here today who, uh, who are still not at the place yet where they can say, Jesus, you are the Messiah. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit is working even now and that, Lord, that person could, um, Lord, that you'd give them the faith profess Jesus Christ as Lord. And I pray for all of us who've known Jesus as Lord for many years, Lord, that we might be faithful and true to you and to your word. Lord, that we might be a lighthouse, we might be an example, that we might be a witness to who you are and all that you do. Father, thank you for loving us today, just as we are, but loving us too much to leave us that way. Now, Lord, we commit ourselves to you, have your way with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jim, come, let's sing. Stand, Stand and with close. With God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels, God of forget those cookies out there. They are designated to uh, make a blessing to you so that you can be a blessing to your new friends. God bless you and amen.